Now let me show you some of the old and rare books collected here at the Library of the National Assembly of Serbia. These books are touched rarely since this library is used only by the MPs of the National Assembly of Serbia and researchers which have special permission, so be extra careful. The old and rare books collections comprise 18th and 19th century editions of laws and constitutions and many other special editions related to the parliamentary activities. And as these books are special, so is our next session and the program of the 50th Liber Annual Conference. One of the highlights of today's program is certainly ahead of us, the parallel sessions. Please join the session of uh, your choosing and feel free to switch between the sessions as if you were on a live conference. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I'm very happy to welcome you to session number five. How can open infrastructure support the role of research libraries? My name is Maike Napolitano and I work for the National Library of the Netherlands. I'm the coordinator of Delphor, which is the Dutch research infrastructure for digitized books, magazines and newspapers. I'm also part of the Liber Annual Conference Program Committee and I'm the chair of this session. In the next one and a half hours, we will have three sessions for you with no less than seven speakers. There will be no break and we will end the session punctually at three o'clock. And I mean punctually, since at three o'clock I have to leave to get my corona vaccination. Um, but before we start, I would like to point, point out some ground rules. Uh, the first is that this session is being recorded. So if you miss anything, don't worry, we will send you the recordings after this, this session, also the slides you will receive. After each, each session, there will be a Q&A. When you have a question, you can send it through the chat window at the moment you're thinking about it. So also during the session, that's no problem. I will keep an eye on the chat and will address the questions to the speakers at the end of the session. The last one is about the technique. This is the second year that Labour delivers its annual conference online in an effort to bring our community get together while still remaining safe. And of course, we hope that the session runs smoothly, but we ask your patience in case of any technical glitches, which can happen. And if you can't get back in, remember that the session will be recorded and if you, you can watch it later on. In today's session, we will hear the following three presentations. Let's see. There's an ambulance. I'm sorry. <laughs> the following three presentations, starting with Fidan Limani from Leibniz in, um, Information Center for Economics in Germany. Fidan works on research data infrastructure related projects including research data management and services implementation for communities in economics and social sciences. As part of his focus, he's also involved with the analysis and implementation of existing metadata standards, conception and implementation of automatic metadata generation and automatic metadata linking to standard bibliogra bibliographical metadata. As part of his research, he focuses on the integration of scholarly research deliverables into digital library environments, including scientific blogs, wikis, data sets, links between resources, and so on. But I'm now happy to turn over the stage to Fidan. Fidan, the floor is yours. Um, let me quickly, hi everybody. Um, glad to meet up with all of you here today. Uh, let me just quickly share the screen. Okay, are we, um, is, is it okay? Can you follow? Is, is this... So yeah, so today um, I will be presenting on the knowledge graphs as means towards a more holistic access to of, of research artifacts, um, uh, discussing it from the domain of digital libraries. So quickly the outline, we'll see some of the scholarly communication changes happening, which are um, making us seek for some opportunities and then move to we move to the knowledge graph approach that we um, how we see it fit what is it and how we see it fit for this uh, opportunities we discuss some of the use cases we have identified or or in the process of um, implementing and then we conclude 
and present some of the future feature uh, future work. So when it comes to the scholarly communication changes, we just present them briefly from a technical and cultural or practical standpoint, then see some of the do not say problems, but rather opportunities that libraries are seeking to, 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 to grasp, and then some of the things we're currently doing at the CPV. So today we are more um, IT empowered, so I have more capability at both personal, department, organizational, or even community level. So um, this also, at, at this point, we can refer to different infrastructures on different research data infrastructures or other types of digital infrastructures, which um, are in different scopes, you know, uh, community, national, international, and so on, and different models for those, such as free, open, commercial, and so on which we can refer to, um, that give us access to, to, to so much um, um, capabilities today. Um, to, to that point, we are able in a way to do more things faster and better. So when it comes to the research life cycle, we can produce um, more in terms of both uh, volume and um, a variety, store more, process more, share more, publish more, and, and, and so on. So we're not um, limited in any way to a single artifact or, or a few of them. So this is all well and good, but at the same time, we have dedicated infrastructures that tailor to these different artifacts. For instance, you have repositories for data, you have um, social-like uh, social collections in, in, in another platform, you have publication in, in a third platform and so on. So which tends to, to, to keep these in a, in a way, um, tucked away in silos, which would put some efforts on the user side to, to retrieve them. So in the library domain, some of the requests we've been uh, receiving are um, about these new or emerging research artifacts. So, so far, and still um, um, research articles or, or the, the literature aspect uh, remains to be the key, but we are seeing other emerging artifacts such as blogs and wikis, uh, research data, um, citation links, social events, and so on that um, coming from different stakeholders in our group, which want to, to have uh, access to a broader offer of, of um, collections at the library. Um, at the ZBV, we're also seeing some response in this direction because um, its flagship portals, such as EconBiz and EconStore, primarily focused on, on literature, are also um, accepting research data. And then we have projects like Journal Data Archive, which is uh, specifically dedicated to, to support um, few journals in economics. Um, with regards to, to, to providing the, the data of those submitting articles there, but also in the in terms of research data, for instance, there are projects which ZPV is involved with, such as Gerdi, focusing on long-tail research data disciplines around across different disciplines, or Consortia Svede, which focuses on um, data from social sciences and other types of uh, research data which are um, in, in different proposals underway. So should we bother to engage with this? We believe so. Even though this is uh, a bit uh, chicken and egg problem, um, we can easily envisage a scenario where somebody captures raw data. Maybe they don't have a hypothesis or concrete research questions yet, which they can uh, test, evaluate, and then publish in an article, but they can just publish the raw data. For that, there are venues such as um, the concept of a data paper, which they can use. And then hopefully somebody else will reuse this raw data and do something with it and credit um, this user initially, and then the cycle will feed and, 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 and go on. And this could happen for the different uh, set of research artifacts, not only um, uh, data, for instance, can be all sorts of um, research artifacts that make sense for the different communities, like scientific notebooks, configuration script for scientific workflows and so on, source code and so on. So at the CPV, we've been experimenting with different types of these so-called emerging research artifacts. Uh, specifically, in addition to publications, we have, worked, we're, we have been working with um, the blogs, citation links, and data. All uh, the goal is from the, from the same domain, so that is the domain of economics and business administration and social sciences. And we have seen that there are different um, research practices there, such as metadata standards, the way they apply it, different types of structure which pertains to the different resources, um, terminology, um, different terminology used there. And so our um, initial take has been to try to bring them to a, to a common representational format um, so that in the process align potentially the terminology because at the ZBV we rely on a thesaurus uh, which is quite important uh, in describing um, the, uh, 
resources which we collect. So a terminology alignment with that thesaurus um, done in an automatic way, of course, um, is, is always sought after. And then we have seen mixed results uh, from this um, effort. So with some resources, it's easier to, 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 to extract keywords, for instance, uh, whereas from others, it's a bit uh, more uh, hard, harder to do so or even not that possible. So working with these individual artifacts and then abstracting a bit away, we have, we have we realized that, okay, we're working in the different types of artifacts which are present in the scholarly communication domain today. But eventually, that's something which is fluid. So we'll see new new research artifacts emerge and become of interest to users, old one fading away slowly and so on. So instead of um, just focusing on the different the details and the, uh, of, of these individual artifacts, the idea was to focus on something which abstract away these tiny details and just see these as resources of the scholarly communication domain, which we will have to tackle in the future. So we cannot limit ourselves to two or three. So we need an approach which considers or takes into view the fact that we need to be able to adapt as new uh, options come along. So this is where the knowledge graph approach um, um, comes into play. So let's see, what do we mean by it? Why we, do we think it is su suitable in some of, some of our work we have done so far? So there is there there is no single definition accepted across the community of what a knowledge graph is, and this is not bad nor surprising, uh, actually, because we have seen as technologies emerge, we have seen standards usually sometimes lag behind. We have diversity in types of uh, what the uh, private initiatives are doing, what the communities are doing, and so on, what the academia is doing. But usually, we can boil it down to something of a um, a, a network or a graph, um, which includes objects of interest to our, from our domain, which are connected between them. Um, so this, this, would, this would suffice, I guess, for, for, for this discussion. And do we see um, knowledge graphs being uh, applied a lot? Yes, we see an emerging of, of different um, application of knowledge graphs and different types and strains, for instance, open versus closed. We have um, knowledge graphs such as wiki uh, data, for instance, which are completely um, open. Uh, and then we have other cases, uh, usually um, more company driven, which are closed um, and not available for everyone. You would need some uh, subscription and so on. So open versus closed. We have uh, the group of enterprise knowledge graphs as well, which tailor to the specific needs of a certain organization, only the resources and and services that uh, are of interest to that organization and nothing else uh, is included in the scope. Then we have knowledge graphs which focus on a broader domain versus those that are specific to certain domains. Um, also, in this context of, of, of the conference, we also um, see an emergence of academic knowledge graphs, such as the Open Research Knowledge Graph, Information Space Graph, and Microsoft Academic Graph, which focus on the uh, different entities or objects from the academia, for instance. So why do we think a knowledge graph would be um, uh, suitable for this case? So let's see in, in the community, in the in this um, scholarly communication domain, we see different types of artifacts. So we have research articles with some metadata. We have data sets with their own metadata. Then we have a different types of resources called um, citation links, for instance, which enable or show us how two different link, uh, entities or objects are connected. So in this case, we know that an article is using certain data set as a primary source of data, or vice versa, a data set is being cited by a certain article, right? So it's clear to us how these objects, uh, what what they are, what type um, they are, so articles, data set, links, and so on, What how they are described, what properties do they have, and how they're connected uh, between each other. Similarly, we could add other types of resources. So blogs which discuss the latest finding or comments or feedback on an article or data set, uh, people working collaboratively on a wiki on, on certain project or something like social um, events type of things, which we can, uh, we, which we would be able to search for certain venues, uh, contribution and so on. So this easily fits into the aspect of, we have some objects which are connected uh, uh, between themselves. So, but then why exactly knowledge graphs? Because the research artifacts we're dealing with are not static. So they would emerge, as we said, we have maybe the article dominating, but now we have research data, links, nano publications, and so on, and the list will grow. So we need to plan for this. We need to be uh, ready for this. So um, the knowledge graph has that integration as a key feature um, in its own, which we like. And then it also supports 
extensibility, meaning if we have new components, new objects, we can easily add them to the graph. And this also includes the aspect of heterogeneity. We don't expect that we will have one, two, few, three types of, of, of resources there. So our approach needs to support this from the get-go. Um, so the knowledge graph represents entities and relationships as we saw before. We have specific um, types of how, what these connections mean, uh, what these connections mean, what these entities are. And then it's they are able to combine with other relevant uh, knowledge graphs. So at the ZBV so far, we have exper experimented with four types of research artifacts so in, in addition to the publication, which come from our Econ Store open access uh, platform. We also included research data from a project we were involved with, Gerdi, which we mentioned, and also the, the journal data archive. And then we also used a um, collection of links between publications and data and data to data and blog posts. Um, so if we uh, present a diagram of, of how the knowledge graph uh, we are implementing looks like, the idea is that we have the level of data sources at the end, they are represented in different formats. We ingest all these metadata uh, from these collections, try to structure them to the extent possible. So as I mentioned in our case, for instance, we have a blog who has um, certain text and maybe doesn't have any keywords or has some. Uh, we try to automatically assign ter uh, terms to it based on the SDW vocabulary that we, we have adopted at the, um, at the organization. So tasks such as those that add more structure or even enrich these um, source metadata. Then we describe these uh, with a set of ontologies or vocabularies and represent them in a common model. Our model of choice in this case is RDF, uh, just because it's a, it's a W3 standard and uh, ZBV as an organization has experience in, in this uh, technology. And then up comes the services layer. So far we have experimented with search, but other opportunities are there for different types of visualizations, analysis, and so on. When it comes to the use cases, um, so currently we are exploring how exactly, um, what would the uh, knowledge graph exactly entail, uh, what would be the final uh, components and the technology implementation in it. Uh, so we don't have a final in production system, but we are just exploring these options. We are trying to also identify how many different layers would we have, what kind of tasks exactly would we do there. But the uh, end result is, the end aim is to focus on an enterprise type knowledge graph, which would cater to the ZBV uh, requirements. So in the process, it is important to identify use cases and it's necessary to include all the different stakeholders which uh, could be involved. And at this point, of, of course, if you have any use case or suggestion for one or recommendation for one, we would really want to hear from you. So what do we have in terms of use cases? Maybe broadly speaking, two different categories. So use cases focused on individual um, artifacts which the knowledge graph holds. So for instance, research data. So we want to see what are the um, research data um, on the topic of uh, fishing quotas for the uh, for the region A um, since 2020, right? Similarly for the different other events, uh, artifacts such as blogs, publications, and so on. So another group of, of use cases pertains to trying to find out different facets from a single research um, effort, for instance, maybe somebody publishes an uh, article, but also publishes the data set and also uh, has a, a blog post written about the experience of, of this somehow. And then we want to retrieve all the different aspects of this, uh, of this, of this uh, research effort, or we just want to see what's there in terms of data sets and publications on the topic of uh, fishing quotas, for instance. So we want to involve more or the different artifacts that we have um, stored. Of course, this all depends on the on the collection that we have. So if we, for instance, even though we have a large collection of citation links, we have a small subset which comes from the domain of economics. As a result, we cannot uh, implement or, or show so many scenarios in that aspect. So um, having the right source data is always um, important, of course. So making sure. So in conclusion, we see knowledge graphs as means to, which could provide this more um, wholesome type of access or picture to, to, to based on the different research deliverables. 
Um, this pertains to the features of publication and disseminating these articles, uh, artifacts, um, or being something of a one-stop shop type of a, a solution, which the user can go and get the different facets of a research effort, or just look um, for different artifacts based on, on, on their requirements. We, of course, tend to tailor it to the domain of economics and social, social, social sciences, and we hope to unlock some interesting use cases in the process. Of course, there exist other knowledge graphs with different scopes and different um, data granularity and different technology um, from different domains. So we usually don't expect to see um, one knowledge graph to rule them all, but rather we would um, see an, an effort to establish collaboration and communication between these different knowledge graphs. So one from social sciences, if could collaborate with another one from um, ocean sciences or, or mar marine biology, and then they could do some analysis on fish quotas and uh, food prices or something like that. So they don't have to be as in part of a single knowledge graph. They could be independently curated and, and maintained, but then they could uh, collaborating would be, um, could give these cross domain, cross disciplinary effect. So in the future, we are tending to, to identify new resources to include in our, uh, as part of our knowledge graph, um, do more with the available artifacts that we have, uh, find more suitable or better ontologies to represent these as, as in a more, more of a packaged way, not, not individually as, as research artifacts uh, as such, and also look into, look into establishing links with other knowledge graphs, which could complement our collections or services. It doesn't only mean, uh, it doesn't have to be only uh, collections, it could be services. Um, so enrich our collection or link up with something which exists there and is maintained by somebody else. And update and man maintenance, of course, uh, plan into place would be also one of our future tasks. So with this, I um, conclude. I believe I've been right on time, yes. So thanks for your attention and feel free to, to email me or chat about any of the questions that you might have. Thank you, Frida. Um, then we now take questions uh, through the chat. So if there are any questions, you can type it in in mm -hmm. the chat and we'll read it. Uh, I'll give you some time to type your questions. You can also type your questions during the presentation. So for the next presentations, you can also type it when you think about it. Um, and for now, there are no questions through the chat, but maybe they will be there. Uh, in the meantime, I understood that Silvio had a question. So maybe uh, Silvio? Yeah, I, I, I will prefer to ask it live. Let's <laughs> say since I have the possibility. Hi, Fidan. First of all, thank you. Thank you a lot for your introduction. I'm very interested in the topic since uh, I I use not to push the, that aspect when I I present open citations in these our audience usually, but open citations is indeed a knowledge graph, uh, and you reuse exactly the same uh, uh, technologies that you mentioned. We have ontologies, uh, we export all data in RDF, and all mm. these kinds of things. So I I'm seeing a lot of potential. Uh, alignments with what you are doing. So I was just wondering if you have um, thought about uh, possible links and even collaboration that we can set up uh, with what you are doing. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Silvio. Yeah, we are looking into to that as well because this idea emerged a bit um, from top to So we arrived, realized it in the process. Oops, this is my alarm. We realized it in the process. We realized it in the process that we could move, um, abstract away a bit, and zoom out and look at these different resources together. One reason why we use citation links, for instance, is because we have both publications and research data. So that is quite handy. For instance, you have a list of citations and you have a list of data sets. So you can say, okay, search for all of these data sets if you can find them in these citations. If you do, tell me what is the other thing this, this data set is citing or related to. And in this way, we can enrich whatever we have in this collection. So we are we are open to collaborating and I will, I will just contact you after after this and then let's see what, what could be of, of, of importance. We looked into open uh, citations as well. Um, that's also a possibility there, yeah. 
So we, okay. yes, we are. Thank you, Frieden. Thank you. Thank so you. let's shut offline then about yes. it. Okay. So it looks like there are no questions um, to the chat, but that's no problem. If the delegates have questions uh, during the next presentations, also to FIDA, you can still type them in and we'll ask them at the end. Um, so that's okay. Then we'll go to the next presentation. Um, it's a session on how open infrastructure benefits libraries, and it's presented by no less than four speakers. So I'll announce them shortly. Uh, short. Neil Stern is the director of the OAPEN Foundation, and in 2008 he was the co-founder of the OAPEN Project, and since 2014 he's an independent expert for the European Commission on Open Science and e Infrastructures. Since 2017 he's head of the Department for License Management at the Royal Danish Library and chief negotiator for the National License Consortium in Denmark. Then we have Joanna. Joanna Ball is head of the Roskilde uh, University Library, a service which is delivered in partnership with the Royal Danish Library. She also leads the Royal Danish Library's Open Science Strategic Initiative to develop collaborative open science services across its three university libraries. Then there is James McGregor, and he has been working with the Public Knowledge Project since 2007. His recent focus is on infrastructure building and larger service and project developments, in particular as concerns uh, Coalition Publica, a pan-Canadian scholarly infrastructure project. He's currently acting as interim managing director. And the last one of the four presenters is Silvio Peroni, and he holds a PhD in computer science and is Associate Professor at the Department of Classical Philology and Italian Studies at the University of Bologna, where he teaches basic informatics, computational thinking and programming, and open science. So the floor is yours, Niels, I guess. I will start. Uh, Silvio, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> apologies for, for that. So uh, good That's afternoon. No uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So um, I'm... I'm Silvio Peroni, I am one of the director of the institution, and I'm here uh, with my fellow speakers uh, listed in order of presentation that are uh, Neil Cern from Open Door, uh, James McGregor from PKP, and Joanna Ball from the Royal Danish Library in Roxilde University Library. And in this uh, presentation, we want to show you in which ways open infrastructures can uh, benefit uh, libraries. Um, we are, uh, the infrastructure involved here are basically uh, supported by SCOS. Uh, that is a network of influential organization committed to helping secure open access and open uh, science infrastructure well into the future. Um, as I anticipated today, in this presentation three of the infrastructure supported by SCOS, Open Citation, DOA, uh, OAPEN, and PKP, uh, will introduce themselves, uh, focusing spe specifically on how they can be beneficial to libraries and in general scholarly communication. Um, next slide, please. So, um, Uh, Niels, I, okay, great, I can see it, thank you. So uh, let me start from introducing, let's say four important values that we believe are important that are conveyed by open infrastructure that are relevant to libraries, but also to the scholarly uh, domain in general. So uh, we believe that open infrastructure enable fairness since they uh, avoid that the institution and independent researcher that doesn't, doesn't doesn't have the possibility to spend a lot of money for uh, buying, for instance, commercial services or software, uh, can indeed use service that they need for they, their daily job that can be researched, but also policy makers, activity or monitoring research and these kind of things. Uh, we think that open infrastructure enable reuse since usually open infrastructure use very permissive licenses that allow maximum discoverability of re and reuse of what they are uh, 
sharing with the general public. And so users can reuse and uh, can use and republish these entities for any purpose. We are talking about data, we are talking about software, we are talking about publications that usually open infrastructure may provide. Then open infrastructure enable transparency that provides basically open and freely available knowledge that is of relevance for, scholarly, for the scholarly ex ecosystem that allow, in principle, transparent and reproducible processes. And finally, the governance, which is a very crucial part, because open infrastructure usually involve the stakeholder community in the governance of the infrastructure itself, and that is useful to build confidence that the organization will take decision future decisions that are driven by the, what the community wants. Uh, and this is a very important aspect to care about. Uh, next slide, please. So um, very briefly, uh, I would like just to spend a few, uh, few seconds uh, talking about open citations. Open citation is one of these infrastructure. Uh, it is an independent non-for-profit for, 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 for profit infrastructure organization, which is entirely dedicated to the publication of uh, open bibliographic and citation data. We make available a lot of stuff there, basically a data model for describing this data, but in particular citation data um, in order to allow anyone to use this data for uh, building new services or doing specific research on the evolution of science. And these data are available by using different ways, REST APIs, sparkling points for programmatic access, but you can even download them in, uh, as a full data for internal use. Next slide, please. So currently we provide more than 700 million citations to the, that the community can reuse for any purpose. For instance, this data can be used uh, for uh, as a crucial vehicle for using national and international research evaluation exercise in order to make this activity as anticipated before more transparent and reproducible, at least compared to what is offered by um, uh, proprietary services. As a librarian, you can use the data, for instance, to enhance or develop new tools to support your users, authors, researchers. Uh, for instance, you can provide metrics to monitor research. You can provide ways uh, or implement new ways to improve the discoverability of your research products and this kind of activity. Next slide, please. And open citation is, has been currently used in a very different kind of context, different kind of projects. Uh, here there is just a, a selection of them, but uh, as you can see, we have been used for developing new tools like uh, the open access uh, helper that allow you to have citation count of papers visualized in a browser. Um, there are different uh, metadata repositories uh, like DBLP, Insightful, and Lens that are using our data by using the API or just the full DAM to increase the coverage of what they present. And also uh, softwares like visualization tools have been developed to show maps of science by, based on open citations that we provide. Next slide, please, and I leave the stage to Niels. Thank you, Silvio, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Niels Stern. I'm director of the OAPEN Foundation, and we are uh, a not-for-profit uh, foundation dedicated to open access books. Our mission is to increase the discoverability of open access books and also to build trust uh, around open access books. And I will in a few slides show how these, this mission is, is uh, made operational and, and how that uh, benefits uh, the libraries. So we are running uh, three open source platforms enabling open access to books. And the first one is the directory of open access books, then the OAPEN library and the OAPEN OA books toolkit. And just a few words about each of these three services. The directory of open access books was uh, launched in 2012. It's uh, a, a fast growing international hub for peer reviewed open access books, uh, hosting more than 43,000 uh, books uh, currently with from, from uh, more than 500 publishers. And all this metadata is freely available and it's really easy to uh, integrate into library catalogs. 
so libraries can uh, receive the metadata feeds in MARC and uh, CSV and other formats, but also uh, harvest uh, the, the, uh, the directory or use the open API to, to get the data. So it's, it's really uh, straightforward to sort of turn on this full um, index of uh, catalog of, of open access books. Uh, the OAPEN library, on the other hand, is a, is a publication platform. So here we actually host uh, books, we distribute the books and we preserve them for uh, around 300 publishers. We have currently uh, around 17,000 open access books in the, uh, in the library. And uh, it's also running on uh, the open source DSpace platform. So it's integratable with um, uh, library catalogs in the same way as uh, the directory of open access books. We've seen a huge uh, increase in the number of downloads, uh, especially over the last period uh, uh, during the, the pandemic. And we, we keep seeing uh, a very high number of usage. Also particularly because uh, many libraries do integrate the catalog uh, into their library systems. And then finally, we also have uh, the OAPEN OA Books Toolkit, which is an information resource where we try to really build trust around open access books by providing a lot of articles written by experts in the field about uh, OA book publishing, um, trying to bust some of the myths uh, related to open access in general and specifically towards uh, open access books. And uh, this is a, a toolkit which we will keep developing with new articles. And it's an open resource which is really targeted towards authors, but very useful to research support teams and, and libraries. And then also engagement and communication, as uh, Silvio said in the beginning, this is really important. So we, we, we need to be engaged with the community to keep developing in, in, a, in a way that is uh, relevant to the community. So therefore we uh, ensure participation through our stakeholder committees. Uh, we have uh, events that for libraries, uh, we have an advisory board uh, uh, we are setting up now for the OAPEN Foundation, and we've just uh, launched a scientific committee for the Directory of Open Access Books, um, where we are building a, a certification service for, for the peer review process. And through different ways of communication, we also want to engage and, and keep being involved in the community which is uh, absolutely important. So without uh, further, I think I'm handing over now to James. James uh, McGregor, please take it away. Thank you, Niels. Uh, thank you everyone as well for this opportunity to talk. And thank you, Mikey, for um, sharing this, this presentation as well. Um, so I'm James McGregor. I've, I've been working with PKP since 2007. Um, I've been acting or interim managing director since September of this year. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, PKP is also a, a beneficiary of the SCOS program. And uh, I'm here talking with, with our colleagues in the, in the SCOS round two on that. Um, I'm going to be talking from a um, sort of an interesting perspective, I think, and uh, in, in trying to encapsulate uh, how libraries can integrate with and engage with infrastructure. So talking a little bit about how this can be a two-way street. Um, and I'm doing so because PKP is a software project, um, but we're also um, a library project. We've been housed at Simon Fraser University Library since 2001, and before that, UN, uh, UBC. Um, so just a brief overview of, of PKP at a glance. Um, we're 23 years old. Um, we developed primarily three applications at this time, open journal systems, which is a scholarly publishing platform uh, for journals and article content, open preprint systems, which is relatively new, but is a preprint server that you can use, uh, open monograph press. Uh, and all of these are open source applications and, and have been and, and will continue to be. Uh, we have 28 staff, we're widely geographically distributed. So a number of folks are in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, um, in Canada, but I'm in Ontario. We have folks in the Maritimes, uh, in Europe, uh, Latin America, all over the place. Um, the PKP community beyond the, the, the core staff is, is, is quite large. Um, we have six major development partners. These are folks who provide us, institutions who provide us with substantial financial and in-kind contributions. So SFU Library, UBC Libraries, University of Alberta Library, uh, 
uh, the University of Pittsburgh yeah, University Library System, uh, TIB in Hanover, um, Stanford, and the Ontario Council of University Libraries. Um, we also have dozens of sustainers, including uh, many SCOS contributors as well, um, and hundreds if not thousands of contributors. And these are folks who contribute code and uh, a whole range of things that I'll, I'll get into in a second. Um, and actually new uh, <laughs> to us, uh, we're, we're, we're establishing just how big the, the usage community of, of PKP is, um, just through a, sort of a usage log analysis project that we have going on in the background now. And we're conservatively, Stating that there are something like 27,000 journals in the world using uh, open journal systems uh, actively, so actively publishing content right now. Um, it's kind of a stunning number. Um, and I actually think it's probably going to establish itself to be higher, than maybe around 37,000 or so. Um, but we are probably the biggest open source scholarly publishing platform in the world at this point. Uh, next slide, slide please, Niels. So there are typical ways to contribute to an open source project like PKP. The first is money, which is great. Uh, thank you to all of our SCOS contributors. Uh, it really, I mean, this is, um, uh, I think, probably a quarter to 40% uh, of our overall sustainability plan comes from uh, contributions from the community. And, and we just can't understate that. Um, it, it makes things go, money makes things happen. Um, we also see a lot of code um, as a software project. We have folks contributing, um, bug fixes, um, pull requests, issues, core code things, plugins, you name it. Uh, and that's a major, major venue for us to, to, to receive support and to engage with libraries and, and other folks. Um, but we see translations, um, which is in a sense code. We have 55 translations for OJS. We see documentation as well. Um, and these are, I think, the fairly standard ways that as a community open source project, we see, we see folks engage with us and, and make sure that, that you know, their, their needs and resources are, are met. Um, next slide, please, Niels. Um, there are more fundamental ways to engage with the software as well. And as a 23-year-old project, we, we, we see that these are actually as important as, as the others, as the code contributions, and that fundamentally even as, as important as, as receiving money um, and, <laughs> and then that kind of support. Uh, and this is to, to actually engage with us as, as a community of use or a community of practice. Um, so through usability and accessibility testing, contributing to our education effort and our education resources, um, to governance, which is something that Silvio talked about in the first slide, um, contributing to the, the advisory capacity and the governing capacity of the actual group is highly important. Um, to make sure that we're um, addressing the needs of that kind of community, uh, of your community and of your users. Uh, and then also um, acting as representatives of, of the community within your own region. Um, through workshops, sprints, webinars, and so on. That's, that's vitally important. We are a distributed team, um, but we're only distributed so far. And, and really, as folks who use the software, you're, you're, you're effectively part of the team. So we, we, we do uh, really appreciate the, uh, the ability for, for folks to, to talk to their groups um, within their own particular regions, especially within their languages um, and areas of expertise. Um, so those are just some ways that we do see engagement. Um, again, the money is great. Uh, <laughs> could, couldn't do it without it. But, but these other areas are, are as vital, if not more vital in some ways, to, uh, to keep this community effort going. Uh, and on that note, I think I will be turning it over to Joanna. Thank you. Thank you, James, um, and, and hello, everybody. Um, my name's um, Joanna Ball, and I'm going to be spending the next few minutes uh, presenting the library perspective. Um, on this topic, uh, talking about our approach at the, at the Royal Danish Library, um, the kind of open infrastructure and initiatives that we've decided to support, as well as some um, personal reflections on the, the future relationship between um, open infrastructure and, and libraries. Thank you, Niels. Um, so why um, have we decided to support open infrastructure and services at the Royal Danish Library. And I am gonna start by talking about money. I'll move on to other things things later. But um, so firstly for us, it's a really obvious way to kind of tick a box in terms of our strategic priorities. Open science is a priority for the Royal Danish Library. It's mentioned explicitly in our strategy. Um, and it's also a strategic priority for the three universities which the Royal Library provides library services for. That's um, Aarhus, Copenhagen and Roskilde. Um, the Royal Danish Library also functions as a national license consortium um, negotiating for resources across um, 
Danish Higher and Further Education. So again, there we see ourselves playing an important role in terms of that transition to, to open access on behalf of Denmark. And we decided that we will support two areas. Firstly, open infrastructure and services, which is what today's um, uh, session is about um, and the, the foundations that the building blocks that we need to collect, preserve, access, share, open knowledge. Um, and secondly, initiatives which support, um, innovative initiatives which support an open access transition. Um, so how do we decide what to support? Um, well, we made the, fund, uh, the decision to, to start funding back in uh, 2020. Um, and we managed to get hold of a, a pot of money, about 130,000 um, euros. And then in 2021, we uh, established a set of um, principles for what um, we want to support. At the moment, these aren't set in stone. They're a work in progress and in the form of it. internal guidelines for ourselves when evaluating resources, but it was really great to see some of them echoed in some of the previous uh, presentations. Um, we prefer to support infrastructure that is community owned and driven. So that's run by the research community for the research community. Um, initiatives should be relevant for Danish research institutions. So that gives a, a fairly broad palette anyway. Um, and we also try to ensure there's a balance between um, discipline areas if, if there are um, initiatives which are specific to a particular discipline. Um, business models should be transparent, so ideally not for profit. Um, and going back to that issue of, of reuse that, that Silvio mentioned, you know, where relevant we look for author retention of rights and, and CC BY licenses. An initiative should be straightforward for us to manage. Um, sustainability or ensuring the sustainability of initiatives is important for us. So when signing up, we uh, usually commit for periods of more than one year to ensure there's some, some financial stability for the initiatives involved. Um, and very quickly, we don't support anything around APC payments. That doesn't fall within the remit of our um, national open access strategy um, or anything with, related to data as that's not our area of responsibility. No, great, thank you. Um, so here you can see an indication, it's not an exhaustive list of the types of in initiatives that we're supporting this year, there's quite a, a mixture in there. Um, but I would say at, at this point that we do prioritize SCOS supported initiatives as we see SCOS playing a really important um, role in kind of quality checking on, on our behalf in terms of these initiatives. So um, now for some, yeah, some, some kind of reflections on, on libraries and, and open infrastructure. And I was really interested to hear Greg, uh, James talk about that two-way street, which I think is so important because at the moment we have just focused, focused on, let's put our money where our mouth is, but I think it's time to do, to do something else. Um, and I would always advocate for libraries providing financial support, but there are other ways. And some of them have been mentioned today, for example, through participation in boards, through working groups um, and, and, and through projects. So an example of, of a project that we're working on at the moment in the Royal Danish Library um, is something we've launched in collaboration with the DOAJ um, with the aim of increasing the number of Danish, Danish journals indexed in that service. The project is important for the, the journals themselves in terms of making them more visible, credible, and um, enabling them to comply with Plan S. Um, but it's also an important way for us as, as a library to support um, uh, both DOAJ and the Danish research community in becoming more open. There are other ways that we can support open, um, open infrastructure through our own work, um, with our own communities, our own teaching, um, and by integrating resources in our discovery systems. Um, in terms of sustainability of resources, um, of, of infrastructure, infrastructure, I would say that the current system um, isn't particularly sustainable. The initiatives we support from our funding um, over and above those from SCOS are the ones that have been recommended to us by researchers or that we happen to have heard of or have had contact with. So that doesn't feel particularly sustainable or systematic to me. And I think there's probably more that we could do in this area, perhaps with initiatives themselves or, or with SCOS. Um, another question for me is around um, sustainability um, and, and disruption. How much we, should we be disrupting? the existing scholarly communication uh, ecosystem, how much should we be um, providing the, 
kind of the building blocks and is it even the library's role to be there supporting the building blocks in terms of scholarly communications um the 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 royal library are funding for open infrastructure is secure for the next um few years but after that um nothing is certain um we chose to set up a separate fund for infrastructure but by doing that we avoided the difficult conversations with our research community and with university administrators saying that we won't take out new subscriptions um, because we've decided to, to, to subscribe, to, we've decided to support an open in infrastructure initiative instead. So I think in the future, we need to be brave at having those conversations with our research communities. Um, and I think, again, that's where we can, we can work with initiatives to, um, to support us in, in that bit of messaging. Um, so just to finish off, the, the title of this session is how infrastructure benefits libraries and I realise I've been talking more about how libraries benefit infrastructure but I think we need to find a kind of a third way as it were which which is about kind of developing mutually beneficial partnerships and go beyond this transactional way of approaching things so that we can really play to each other's strengths. Thank you very Thank you. much for your presentation all of you for <laughs> It was a really rich presentation. Um, people can type in their questions through the chat again, just like last time. Um, and while we wait for the questions, uh, I understood that there was a question from the, in this group. I thought Neil, so someone else had a question for Joanna? Um, I, I did have a question for Joanna, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, Joanna, that's, that, that was a great presentation. Thank you. And it, uh, it really, um, um, corresponds with what we've been seeing in Canada with I think the the libraries grappling with what their role is here in supporting this infrastructure and it feels to me like the what the change is is uh, going from sort of being new, neutral providers of a service to like more um, much more engaged advocacy um, roles and, and I mean in the library perspective here um, we have a number of institutions becoming effectively publishers too, you know, they consider themselves as, as providing active services like that. Is that something that you, you, you see happening as well? Um, sort of that, that trend over the past year or two, or what's, what's your sense? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, our focus is kind of completely shifting from supporting local needs to try to, to support, um, a, you know, a global approach to, to open infrastructure. Um, I, so yes, I agree, but I think it's, it, I think even though there are libraries that are convinced that that's the right way to go, we haven't necessarily convinced our research communities um, that that's the right way to go. And we haven't necessarily convinced our, ourselves, well, I said ourselves, our, all of our staff, we're still, we're still set up to, uh, with the kind of the purchase subscription model in mind. So we need to kind of rethink our, everything we do actually in terms of, and so that we can, refocus our efforts to be able to support open a bit better and that you know includes thinking about what kind of services we use on a day-to-day -day basis and being better to to use open infrastructure to promote it um when, when we're speaking to our communities but yeah absolutely it also um it, it requires a different resource allocation for staff and education training uh and sometimes workload too you know uh and that that that's actually sometimes a challenge that we've heard here um, yeah. Folks have to know how to do a whole range of new things. Yeah. Absolutely, it's about you know new skills, new mindset, um, and things like that don't happen just overnight um, in libraries. Can I just uh, also add a question and, and thank you for your presentation, Joanna? I think uh, you focused on on sustainability, which I think is is really key in in this area because. Um, while we are very happy and grateful to all the institutions that have supported us for one year, two, even three years, uh, of course, uh, our plans are, you know, uh, we, we plan to become a sustainable infrastructure that you can rely on in, in the long run. And, and um, so, and, and you really touched upon something which uh, is quite important, I think, and, and we discussed in a previous uh, Libra session here that how, how to flip uh, some of those locked in budgets that uh, libraries have for licenses and for, you know, purchasing content into supporting open infrastructures. And, and I, I, 
I acknowledge that this is difficult, um, but do you have any more concrete ideas on how we could be helpful to you in that process? Um, I th in terms of, I think there's something there around messaging, helping us to, to communicate that um, out to our research communities. Um, so the moment we, we've taken the decision in the Royal Library to have a completely separate fund and not to touch the subscriptions um, budget. And as you know, we recently negotiated a very successful deal with Elsevier, which meant there, were, there, were, there was a little bit of savings, but that money then went back to the research community for its, um, for an, for, for the, to enable the research community to do more research because that's the core work of, the, of, of researchers. But actually publishing and communicating research is also a core part of the research process. So we, we can't just expect that bit of the research process to survive if we stop funding it. Um, so I think there's, there's something there around, around messaging, there's something around advocacy. I think there's a role for, for SCOS or an umbrella organization to really, um, to, to really, or one, one of the other organizations, I know there are others out there, to really help us and really support and advocate for open infrastructure and the necessity of open um, open infrastructure within our communities. Okay, Thank we you. also have a question from the chat, um, which is Suzanne Tatham. She asked a question about, there can be a tension or resource issue between opting for open, open source solutions that may require local resource and outsourcing to commercial products products, sorry. <laughs> Are there any thoughts about that? Um, yes, and actually when I was talking about using yeah. open infrastructure, I was thinking that actually there are institutions where um, the IT strategy is very much against using open source, um, open infrastructure and actually buying off the shelf systems. So I think it's really difficult for for institutions that have a tension between um, what they want to do or the, what the library wants to do and what the um, what the IT strategy is of the institution, and again, it's about um, you know it's about advocacy and, and communicating with IT. But at the end of the day, it's not it's not um, it's not up to us. It, it really requires a, 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 a you know, huge um, investment in terms of, of skills and expertise if we're going to going to work with open infrastructure. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there was only this one question for the chat, but that's okay. Still, you can type in your questions during that next session. And then I want to thank you all for this um, session. Then we go to the final session of today, the final presentation, I must say, which has two speakers. The first is Emily Blotier, I hope I'll pronounce correctly. <clears throat> She's a triple project manager, and before joining the Humanum, um, a French research infrastructure devoted to social sciences and humanities, which is in the scope of the CNRS, the French National Center for Scientific Research, she graduated with a master in digital humanities, applied to historical disciplines and a degree in history. The other presenter is Tiziana Lombardo. And she has over 15 years of experience as the project coordinator within R&D IT related international co collaboration projects in public and private sector. And also in different fields comprising cultural heritage, digital preservation and research infrastructures. Her interest includes um, EU policy development in the ICT domain and digital transformation in the cultural sector. sector. The Net7, she is in charge of the coordinating of the digital humanities units. She is sorry. She is in charge of the of coordinating the digital humanities unit and its business strategy. Uh, so now the floor is yours for the last presentation. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see my full screen. I'm very pleased to be part of this session. And what we would like to share uh, with you this afternoon, Tiziana and I, is how the Opera's research infrastructure supports open communication in social sciences and humanities. Um, first, first, we will uh, present uh, the Opera's 
infrastructure and two of its main European funded projects, whose aims are to facilitate the research in SSH and to enhance collaborative engagement on societal issues. Uh, first, OPERAS is a research infrastructure created in 2016 and with a legal entity since 2021. It is composed of 53 members from 16 countries from all over Europe and 10 core members. The ISBL is coordinated by Suzanne Dumouchel from CNRS, the French National Scientific Research Center, and Pierre Mounier, the community coordinator from the EHESS, which is the French School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences. Uh, OPERAS supports then open scholarly communication in the social sciences and humanities. It coordinates, federates resources in Europe to address the scholarly communication needs of researchers. Um, OPERAS aims is to make open science a reality for research in the SSH and achieve a scholarly communication system where knowledge uh, produced in the SSH benefits researchers academics, libraries, students, and more generally, the old society across Europe and worldwide without barriers. Operas development is centered on user, on users' needs being multi-stakeholders. That is to say, scholarly authors, scholarly readers, libraries, funders, socio and economic actors and publishers. Here you can see the main layers of the actors being part of OPERAS ecosystem. First, e-infrastructures, uh, which provide basic services regardless of any discipline. Then you have the SSH ERICs, which focus on data from various perspectives, what is common to scholarly communication. Then the national representatives uh, through the implication of the different members of the, of the infrastructure. And finally, on different networks to provide opera services to the whole community in Europe and also worldwide. Um, here are the main services provided by operas uh, via publishers, um, uh, Yes, developed by Opera, sorry, and its members to help researchers and publishers. The objectives are to federate, aggregate, scale, share, open access to all, and help the services to integrate the EOSC. First, we provide a certification service via publishers' peer review processes. Um, Operas is also developing a, dis a discovery platform in SSH, including innovative services to foster collaboration between researchers, but also build bridges between science and society. It also develops a platform for the integration of research and society. Those two projects that you can see in the screen, Triple and Coheso, uh, which are two European funded projects, will be presented to you in a few seconds by Tiziana more in details. It offers also a dashboard for using metrics for open access books, and finally, a catalog of publishing service. Responsible research and innovation is a key action of science and for uh, with and for society. In the European Projects Frameworks, uh, implementation of responsible research and innovation actions is envisioned on thematic elements, public engagement, open access, gender, ethics, and science and education, and via integrated action that, for instance, promote institutional change. Both projects, COESO and Triple, and also OPERAS, have a common vision and a participatory approach with a key attention on engaging all stakeholders and involving them also, for instance, in the co-design of the services. And to go now a bit more on details about the projects, I will leave the floor to Tiziana, please. Thank you, Emily. Um, as mentioned by uh, Emily, uh, there are these two initiatives uh, funded by the European Union that aims at developing uh, services uh, for the SSH community 
in line with the opera's uh, scope. Uh, the first one I'm going to present is COESO, uh, which has a strong focus on uh, citizen science in SSH and particularly um, uh, wants to overcome those obstacles that uh, uh, hinder the participatory research in SSH. Um, it will deliver a virtual ecosystem for research activation called VERA and um, coupled with a set of collaborative tools and services. Um, the project started in January uh, 2021. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, the um, development of the platform uh, just started. We are currently in the design phase of the uh, uh, user needs. Uh, so, this is a, a, an overview of, of the concept behind the Vera platform that uh, wants to be a collaborative environment for uh, sustaining and enhancing this knowledge sharing and collaboration among society and researchers. Um, so the target uh, audience will be researchers, but also citizens, funders, policymakers, socioeconomic actors. Um, and there will be a set of tools that will uh, enhance this collaboration. Uh, one will be the matchmaking uh, service, uh, so there will be discussion tools, uh, um, tools to support dissemination of project results. Uh, uh, to identify collaboration opportunities and to support funding. We, we heard the word money several times in this, uh, <laughs> in, in this uh, session, and uh, you will hear about that uh, later on again. Next slide, please. For what concern uh, Triple uh, is a project that started earlier than COISO. It started in October 2019. Um, and aims at uh, um, tackling the uh, fragmentation uh, in SSH research. Um, so be, having started earlier, the platform development is in a more mature stage and it will be released in a, in a few months. And uh, the project will deliver a discovery platform specifically dedicated to SSH researchers and also involving a larger audience such as citizens, journalists and enterprises. It will uh, support uh, multilingual services and uh, also innovative services uh, useful for the community. Next slide, please. Uh, so, as, as I said, the main impact uh, of the Triple project and its platform, Go Triple, is this overcoming of the fragmentation of SSH research by ensuring uh, uh, the reusability of SSH resources, uh, uh, enhancing their findability and accessibility. Uh, this will foster also this interdisciplinary um, cultural, cross cultural cooperation. Uh, and support also the scientific and industrial applications. The, the, the services, uh, the innovative services that will be developed uh, in detail um, will be the virtual, this, the visual discovery system. And uh, shall I wait, I wait a while for the screen to come back? Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. No I just had an issue. I'm sorry because I have to, to, to take up the full screen and then to go back. Oh, sorry for this. Um, That's okay, it, it, <laughs> it happens and the... <laughs> okay, I have to move that to find a way, how can... Okay, it should, uh, it is, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Tiziana. Okay. No, no problem. Thank you. So um, I I'll start back in this slide. So as I said, the, uh, the aim of the GoTriple platform is to overcome this fragmentation, uh, ensuring uh, the findability and accessibility and so the reusability of these resources, foster cross-cultural uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, and also it will be the, together with the discovery service, there, there will be some innovative services developed specifically for the community, namely a visual discovery system, an annotation service, a trust building system, a recommender system, and the crowdfunding platform. Next slide, please. Mm 
going back uh, to Coeso on the other side, um, the aim of the platform that will be developed of, the, of VERA is uh, to become a meeting point among the different communities. So the SSH1, the Open Scholarly Communication, the Citizen Science Community, and European initiatives. The aim is uh, to support collaborative practices uh, in SSH citizen science projects, but also in identifying new methodologies, uh, identifying obstacles, and also experimenting new ways of overcoming these obstacles that, uh, that uh, um, doesn't allow an efficient collaboration among uh, uh, civil society and SSH projects. So the engagement with different stakeholders is, uh, is also crucial here. Next slide, please. Uh uh, the two platforms share together uh, the main IT partner, and uh, this ensures uh, that the two platforms do not overlap in terms of services. Uh, we really don't want to reinvent any wheel, and uh, we, uh, we want to, to create two services that are really complementary for the communities. Going uh, a little bit more in detail into, into the interoperability of the platforms, technically speaking, uh, few features are already planned to be completely interoperable. Uh, for instance, the matchmaking tool and features developed in Vera will be uh, um, useful and uh, used for the advanced discovery services. And uh, the opposite is also true, that the advanced discovery service will be also used for uh, developing the matchmaking feature engine. Uh, again, also the projects and initiatives that will be listed uh, and promoted into the VERA platform will be fed automatically in the GoTriple ingestion pipeline. And uh, uh, the recommender system uh, that is going to be developed in GoTriple will, will be plugged automatically uh, via APIs into the VERA platform. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another thing I would like to mention, because uh, before I present the user story, is that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, also uh, the possibility of reuse the services, the innovative services that will be then plugged into the GoTriple platform. Here you have a concrete user story example of how GoTriple can support uh, uh, the SSH research. Uh, Maria is a, a consultant, a policy advisor, and uh, wants to write a report addressing social economical uh, impact, uh, uh, social economical impact of COVID-19. Uh, so what she will need is to access raw data in a format that she can query this data, but also she will need accurate data. The current challenges so far uh, is this lack of access to original data sets, lack of time to read the all to be sure that we have read all the relevant papers and the compatible formats of data sets. So thanks to Triple, she can uh, search into data sets, save uh, these searches in her dashboard, search for recent publication, uh, visualize the data that she collects so uh, she can be guided into her research and uh, uh, access to advanced and restricted uh, searches. Next slide, please. Uh, for what concern uh, uh, Coeso, uh, we are uh, um, developing uh, 10 different uh, pilots uh, to represent a variety of disciplines and the societal challenges uh, and the different type of engagement with citizens. Uh, at the proposal level, we have identified five pilots and already engaged the stakeholders while we're going to launch a call uh, in the next few months to um, to recruit five more pilots. The first five pilots will investigate, uh, um, one will investigate how tourism impact the public spaces uh, and also how uh, the, the, the um, tensions that are created by massive tourism uh, on uh, inhabitants of a city, and how different SSH disciplines can collaborate together. Uh, for instance, the pilot dance and philosophy that uh, wants to uh, develop stronger sense of autonomy in uh, people, uh, how social evolutions can pass through the common reuse of uh, properties confiscated to mafias. 
the impact of investigative reporting and how accessibility and probability of tools and databases is useful for journalists to develop, uh, uh, to tackle corruption and collusion. And also the, the um, migrant knowledge theme, uh, so how we can support a systemic collaboration to address migration. Next slide, please. So both uh, uh, projects insist on, on the same domain, which is the SSH1, of course. Um, in terms of community, uh, uh, the triple project is more focused on researchers, research institutions, private companies and citizens. And COISO also tackles individuals such as artists and journalists, funding agencies, uh, citizen science organizations and NGOs, NGOs, and of course, policymakers. Next slide, please. Uh, coming back to the money issue, uh, both projects uh, want to tackle uh, the, uh, the problem that the research has, this lack of funding, and I would like to say that SSH uh, ha has a bigger problem <laughs> than uh, ever. Uh, so uh, the solutions that the two projects uh, will adopt um, will be for COESO, uh, the integration of a funding tool that uh, is going to be based on the fund.it database, which is a database that collects funding and mobility scheme in SSH. It will be, of course, narrowed uh, for cit on citizen science projects in SSH and will uh, facilitate uh, the search of its existing funding schemes. But at the same time, the aim is to increase the ability of funding organizations to allocate funding for activities that will target public engagement elements in the spirit of responsible research and innovation. GoTriple instead is going to develop a crowdfunding service to especially to fund the non-funded projects, to help researchers fund their projects, thanks to the support of non-academic stakeholders that may have interest in the, to fund the project because they really see an added value for them in the, in the results. It's quite, I would I say that it was an innovative approach uh, because uh, it will be particularly relevant for this type of SSH addressing societal issues. Next slide, please. Jeez. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, we are here. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. This was the last presentation of today. Uh, remember, if you have questions, type it into the chat. Uh, we have received, so to give you some time to type the questions, we have received a question for the first speaker. Uh, Fidan, yes, he's still here. Um, Fidan, the question is from Bolet Jurik. She asks um, if the knowledge graph is used to model the services or the data or both, um, because she thought it sounded like the one first and then the other. So that's the question. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks for the question. So it it so not the knowledge graph graph ultimately should contain both. So it should contain its uh, data sources or its um, semantic layer maybe. And on top of that, it should also contain services. Um, so maybe be because of the effort so far, we have been focused on gathering different artifacts and it seems that it, it's just the research data that is, should be produced as a, as a result of it, but it should, it should con consist both because ultimately users would be, should be able to somehow access to this. And um, yeah, so services and data. And of course you can also think about being able to export certain collections from the knowledge graph also, and then others can develop services on top of that or new services, which we did not envis envision, see or need. So both. Okay. Thank you. We have not received any questions from the chat. Um, maybe is there someone else in our group who has questions? I saw someone joining. I have actually, a, I don't know if it is a question, a comment or, or a request for help, but <laughs> to, to, to Joanna. Um, since I didn't have time to ask her before, but since we have time now, um, Joanna, you spoke about the possibility of having 
active collaboration between open infrastructure and libraries, not only about you know money uh, as you anticipated, but something that work co cooperatively for reaching a goal, which is a common goal. So uh, to, to, to that specific direction, I was wondering uh, to a specific use case that we have in open citations, which is gathering of new citation data. Of course, we are using existing sources for doing that, but they are not covering all the possible citation data out there. And in particular, just to um, link with what Tiziana just said, uh, SSH domains, disciplines, usually ha have a, a lesser coverage in existing data sources. So I was wondering if, if infrastructures like us provides appropriate interfaces, uh, I mean, possibility of ingesting Excel documents just to use very simple uh, tabular, tabular formats for fill up uh, metadata information and citation data of this kind. If we provide tools that allow um, people, expert people working in a library to fill up with appropriate metadata, citation, and these kind of things, you, do you think that libraries may become a reasonable uh, source of this kind of information? So the point is that, uh, do you think that libraries may uh, appoint one person or just, you know, a small effort uh, of one person dedicated to provide new metadata to us for enriching the citation data that, that in, in, as a consequence, you can reuse in your own service for showing, I don't know, links with others' data and these kind of things. So using this kind of crowdsourced approach by libraries for enriching uh, the overall knowledge graph, open knowledge graph that we make available of citation links. Yeah, that's a really interesting approach. I mean, th th there have been initiatives previously, not around an open metadata where libraries have shared metadata collaboratively. Um, so I don't see why that, that something like that couldn't happen. Um, and that libraries couldn't kind of give in-kind contributions and not necessarily financial, but use the skills that, that we have as a sector to, for, for, you know, to benefit open infrastructure. I don't see why that, um, why that can't happen. Um, but obviously there would need to be much more discussion. But yeah, I, yeah, I, of I, course. I, but I, I don't see why that couldn't be a possibility. Because as sure. James also anticipated, of course, money is something that, open infrastructure needs for, for uh, daily activities, but uh, curators is something that us, mm. as open citation, we don't have curators of these things and we need it. It's clear mm. that we, we need a clean data and only curators, human curators, can provide clean data. Uh, we, we do our best we, uh, using automatic processing for doing and cleaning up the data, but of course we will need human curators and it is totally impossible for a, a small infrastructure organization as open citation to have internal curators, we have other problems right now to address. That's why I was just wondering that, that uh, even, a cont even if financial contribution is not possible for libraries, which is totally fine. I mean, not all of the libraries have, have the possibility of providing uh, and supporting financially open infrastructure. Maybe uh, having this other kind of contributions are an added value as well mm. because it improves the, the data that we offer and that can be reused by the community that's why i was yeah absolutely Thank so you. it's it's still money that's a, you know, it's, it exactly time, it's, time is still money um, yeah and it's still it's still vulnerable because what's the first thing that a library will cut when it has to cut you know, i mean it has to make a big cut in, in staff resources it's going to cut this, the things that they consider as nice to so the key is to make these in, initiatives need to not not nice to yeah i agree the news is also having a question yes thank you um probably to all of you but also uh, maybe specifically to joanna or i mean within this uh, libra context i think we we um it's it's a great uh, association for um for for libraries and and where you can 
can meet and discuss many of these things. So I was just wondering, uh, Joanne, if how you um, develop strategies and ideas around what you presented with other libraries, either through Libre or through other fora, and you know how we could then uh, think of engaging in in that way. Because I mean, of course, the variety of of libraries uh, is is immense, and and you know from country to country and so on. If how how that would be, you know, uh, would that be a way of you know collaborating for moving forward? Um, yes, <laughs> I th yeah, I think it, it would be. I think it's quite hard to kind of identify organisations for you to target. I mean, we are really good networkers, um, libraries, and we, we do speak we do speak to each other an, an, an awful lot. Um, so yes, I think there's definitely potential there but in terms of how you would you know tap into all those organizations i'm not quite sure but yeah that would be given a very good answer to your question i'm afraid yeah. i don't know if anyone else has got anything to contribute to that no well i think that means the end of this session because there are no questions in the chat anymore but if people have a question or maybe in an hour you think, oh, I want to ask this, you can reach out to the speakers directly and you can send them an email or set up your own conference call if you want. So feel free to ask questions if you have them. Um, and that leaves me with thanking you for joining us today. Um, we will be sending you an, a survey about the experience. And I would like to ask you to fill it out so we can prove future Liber, in, uh, Liber conferences. And as I told you before, we will be sending you a link to the recordings and the slides of today. So thanks for joining us and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Have Thank a nice you. day. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.